If you're interested in the topics that you're hearing about on The Vibe, please check out our website. It's thevibeweekly.com. There you can subscribe to our weekly newsletter. You can check out all the blogs with all of the recommendations that Dustin makes, links to purchase things, full videos, links to articles. It's a great resource to go even a little bit deeper on some of the topics that we talk about on the podcast. Welcome to episode four mm-hmm. uh, of the Vibe podcast. <laughs> the Vibe Unplugged. The Vibe Unplugged. Uh, we're excited today to, to be with you and jump into some different topics for uh, from the Vibe over the past couple of weeks. Um, and the first one that I wanted to dive into with you was the topic of discipline. Mm. I think you and I talk about that a lot. And what were your thoughts in reading the essay and... Um, just generally on discipline. I, I like the message of it. I agree with you that I think something you talk a lot about is how important adversity is. And um, it's something that we think about with our kids a lot in terms of when you have discipline and you kind of force yourself to go through adversity and force yourself to get up and keep going. It really builds your character and your resilience as a person. And I think that um, it remain, reminds me a lot of, I think it's it's Tony Robbins or, you know, one of those people, but always says that it's not about achieving the goal, it's about the person that you become in pursuit of achieving a goal. And I think discipline is really the primary characteristic of that. And so for me this year, I've been focusing on being a little bit more disciplined with my morning routine mm-hmm. because that's something that I always do it, but sometimes it's last minute and kind of half-hearted. And so I've actually moved my wake-up time earlier and been really trying to be more disciplined about that Mm -hmm. to start our day off on the right foot. Um, But where was your head at when you were writing this one? Yeah, there was kind of an undertone to it as well. I think it seems like in society today, and and who knows, this is probably for all of eternity, but um, human beings just seem to be kind of programmed to blame external factors on Mm -hmm. their own conditions. And... It just seems like we cannot walk through life today without hearing someone blaming a politician or a sure. business leader or circumstance or whatever it might be for the challenges they have in life. And I don't want to um, downplay or dismiss, you know, people are going through real challenges and some people, you know, have, have uh, adversity that others don't. You know, mm-hmm. that's a real thing. But at the same time, I think especially if, if you were uh, fortunate enough to be born in this country, uh, we all mm-hmm. have a way out and we all have an opportunity to improve ourselves and to find the success or the fulfillment or achievement that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And I think that so much of that uh, is just around discipline and doing the things that you don't feel like doing uh, every day, Mm -hmm. uh, even when you don't feel like doing them and being consistent with that. And so that was kind of my thoughts in, in diving down this path too, especially as we enter the uh, worst time of the year, which is election season. Now that we're <laughs> but you meant winter. <laughs> well, winter is winter is worst always, but um, yeah. we're moving now into the political arena um, as we as we come towards the presidential election. And so, uh, it just seems like more and more every day on social media and just in the public mm-hmm. that people are blaming politicians and, and other leaders for the challenges they have. I do agree with that, and I think it's um, it's very disempowering to think that your fate in life is determined by somebody else or an external force outside of your control. And so, I think for people's mental health, it's good to realize that you have agency and you have the power to change your circumstances. And right, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, nobody else is going to come save you. It's really up to you to forge your own path. So, yeah, I think it's a timely message. Yeah, and we can, of course, we can only control what we can control. Right. You know, we can't um, we can't determine what. Joe Biden or Donald Trump or anyone else is going to do in the White House, but we can control our own personal circumstance right. and we can control our response to the things that happen to us as well. Mm-hmm. And I think so much of that does um, revolve around discipline and it just seems to be a character trait that, um, <clears throat> at least from my experience, uh, we could use a little nudge in that direction, maybe more uh, than we have at different times uh, in, in humanity. I do question that a little bit. I think that's funny because I think older generations always think that about younger generations. And probably to some extent, I would imagine it's true just as life gets more comfortable, discipline is less of it's required. But I was actually just thinking about a podcast I was listening to recently where they said that the people that were born in like 1910 were the flappers and they were considered the most like silly, like 
soft generation ever. And then the Great Depression hit and then World War II hit. And that generation had to step up and really go through some really tough times and then ultimately became called the Great Generation. And so I do think some of it is just societal, cultural influences based on the time in history in which we're born. Um, But it's funny that you see that repeated over and over again in history where previous generations think the younger generation is less gritty, less wise, all of these things. Yeah, and it goes back to like the seasons that that Tony Robbins and others talk about too. And, um, you know, the winter in the summer and mm-hmm. going through those seasons in life. And I guess I guess my thoughts around that are not necessarily even generational um, as much as it is just, um, you know, th- things, whether we like to believe it or not, things as a society are much better than they have been for, you know, human history. Mm-hmm. You know, we have indoor plumbing. And <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> we have medication and advancements in science and technology and all these different things. And so... Just through um, these innovations and advancements, mm-hmm. like our lives are easier. That's True. a fact. You know, we can argue the mental health side of that, uh, of course. Mm-hmm. You know, because there's some different challenges around that too. But um, we don't have to go out and hunt our food to eat anymore if we don't want to. <laughs> Going way back, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and so, I think with that comes maybe uh, some some lax behavior around True. discipline uh, because it's not as necessary. You know, it, mm-hmm. if you didn't wake up at a certain time and um, you weren't uh, able to hunt the food that you were looking for, mm-hmm. then you may not survive, you know, and that's mm-hmm. not the case today. And especially in this country, I mean, if we sleep until 10 o'clock every day um, and uh, we can rely on others to provide for us, you know, and it's not the life necessarily, maybe that most of us would want, but um, we will survive in most cases. <laughs> yeah, no, I guess that's true. It's not innate that you have yeah. to be disciplined in order to survive. And so you have to build it for yourself. But I do think as humans, we're always happier when we are disciplined disciplined, you know? And so I think for that reason, it is important, like you said, but yeah, that's interesting. Technology allows us to not have to be so disciplined. Yeah. And it's that delayed gratification piece. You know, Mm -hmm. I think the discipline is like that short temporary pain, but eventually I think that pain almost becomes rewarding in and of itself because you Mm -hmm. you build that muscle and it's fun to, to wake up early and, and and you know, what's coming after that hard workout at the gym or whatever Mm -hmm. it might be too. And so I think that that's just, um, I think it's an important topic for us to consider today, you know, especially, Mm -hmm. like I said, as we go into this the season of uh, presidential campaigns, which is which is never fun. <laughs> Plus, we're also at that season where New Year's resolutions are starting to fall to the wayside. So it's yes, a good reminder. <laughs> absolutely. Um, well, one of the topics that you and I uh, talk about almost every night because we're uh, both obsessed with this is cheese. Cheese, <laughs> yes. We can debate cheese for hours at a time. <laughs> Uh, and we have tried so many different types of cheeses. It's funny, whenever we go to a different city, uh, either in this country or, or abroad, um, the I think the number one criteria for us in looking at a menu and deciding on a restaurant is whether or not there is a cheese or charcuterie mm-hmm. board on the menu. That's um, accurate. So we, uh, I don't know that there's, I would guess that there's less than, I don't know, five days a month that we don't have some sort of cheese in our diet. Yeah, I mean, I struggle to think of a day that I don't have some cheese because mm-hmm. it's on my breakfast sandwich in the morning and my cheese board at night. Yeah. Pretty much every day. So what are your favorites? I mentioned Midnight Moon mm-hmm. and the vibe, which I know we both like. And I, I think for most people, they think like goat cheese is like something completely different. Mm-hmm. And um, it's not maybe as sharp as cheddar or just has a totally different vibe to it. And I think yeah. you'll be surprised when you try Midnight Moon. Yeah, no, I love Midnight Moon, and I think we just stumbled across it on a cheese board one time, um, and it was very good. And it does get overwhelming to me. It almost feels like a wine list when you're like, this is a raw sheep's milk yeah. cheese, or this one is a semi-firm, buttery cow's milk. You know, I just like to taste them and see what I like. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know that I'm super boring with cheese and the fact that I always want a, just a super sharp white cheddar, and I'm obsessed with that. Yeah. Um, but Midnight Moon is definitely up there. And then for me, I like to balance that out with like a brie or like one of the soft or cheeses. Mm -hmm. But I have to admit that I'm even a little bit nervous putting this on air because recently I had the fortune of hanging out with Megan Key, the owner of Bramble and Brine. Mm -hmm. Um, We were filming a Get Local there and she obviously knows her stuff inside and out about cheese and she made me laugh because she said that she really judges people based off of (laughs) what kind of cheeses they like and how they put things together on the cheese board and that was the inspiration behind their really fun, like already composed cheese board at Bramble and Brine. So if Megan does listen to this, I'm sorry if I'm saying 
of the wrong cheeses put together. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what about you? What are your favorite ones? Yeah, I mean, of course, I like the really sharp white cheddars as well. But <clears throat> I think for me, I like variety mm -hmm. within the cheese board. Like yeah. I know if you just had a, a big cheese board of cheddar, you would be happy. Cheddars mm -hmm. and, and different meats. Um, but I like a little bit of cheddar. I like some different uh, Spanish cheeses, like a manchego. Mm -hmm. I love Swiss cheese, which I know is not like necessarily not traditional favorite. on a cheese board. Mm -hmm. But I just I love Swiss cheese and especially on sandwiches and things, too. Um, but I don't know that I've, I, I, I was about to say, I don't know that I've tasted the cheese I don't like, but I will take that back. The most like pungent and potent, like blue, blue. cheeses I don't love. And there are some like French cheeses that are like kind of like stinky cheeses mm -hmm. that I also don't like. Mm -hmm. So there, there are some that, that would fall off the list for me in terms of things I would have on a cheese board. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're not a big fan of blue. I do like actually the one at Bramble and Brian, the blue cheese that they had there was mm -hmm. very good, but it wasn't so overpowering. Yeah. 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 And then meat is very important as part of the cheese <laughs> yes. board as well. And we, I think, both like the the hamon. Is that how you say it? And, and <laughs> yes. The hamon. Um, some of the Spanish the ham. meats. Yes, the ham. Um, but also, uh, you know, I like to like cook up like a bratwurst or uh, something like a sausage or something, and then yeah. slice that up uh, for for the boards as well. And other people that like that, the best place for that is Liquid Assets in Ocean City. Mm -hmm. They have an insane cheese selection anyway, but you can get all sorts of grilled sausages on the cheese board too, which are really good. Yeah. Yeah, and you also like like chorizo and kind of spicier sausages I feel like too I do and you know my obsession with hot sauce and so a cheese board is not complete without hot sauce as well and so it's funny when we go into a really nice restaurant and they bring out the charcuterie board or whatever it is and I say can I have some hot sauce they're very confused as to what the hot sauce is for but I dip both the cheese and the meat and the bread in the hot sauce and so yes I know it's a little odd and weird but it adds some some nice variety to it and you dip the rest of your meal in the hot sauce too yes I do they come and try to take it away between courses it's like no please no. the worst is like the the nicer restaurants bring out these little tiny bottles of Tabasco, mm -hmm. which you get like 11 drops out of. And so I need like 35 of them to peel open and I have this like pile of trash next to me <laughs> of, of hot sauce wrappings. So um, a note to any restaurants listening, get the get the big bottle and don't be ashamed of bringing it out uh, oh no matter how nice the restaurant is. <laughs> well, I think we've gotten to a point in most places where we go where they just bring out five of them at once yeah. if they're going to bring it to you. Yeah, absolutely. No, but, but cheese boards are so fun. It's like you're constructing your meal as you go and you can be creative and pair this with that and mm -hmm. I don't, we always have a good time with that yeah it's like art a little bit too mm -hmm. but um we uh one of the things that we love putting on our cheese board is some kind of hummus or dip or something as mm -hmm. well um, along with vegetables and mm -hmm. so we don't carrots and cucumbers and all kinds of different things mm -hmm. um, i like making buffalo chicken dip so that's been a big piece of it yeah um, that we include on the boards too just to kind of mix it up for variety would make it a little healthier not just all cheese and meat yes well, shifting gears and jumping into um, some podcast recommendations, mm. I know you and I both have been obsessing over the Founders podcast and yeah. just like running through those episodes and, and listening to several on repeat. Um, but one of the ones that I just mentioned recently was the um, Brad Jacobs one, um, how to, I think it was like how to make a few extra billion or something. Yeah, just a casual <laughs> few billion, yeah. Um, and I thought that that one was so good and so inspiring because I hadn't, I hadn't really heard of Brad Jacobs no. before. Um, you know, there's... There's lots of billionaires uh, in the world, um, mm -hmm. and he was one of them. But I hadn't heard his story, and um, I thought it was a really inspiring podcast that kind of helped me think about business a little bit differently. What were your thoughts on, on that one? Yeah, I agree. Same. I hadn't heard of him before, and I was just really impressed. He also just seems, for being a billionaire, multi-billionaire, just a very down-to-earth, genuine person. Mm -hmm. um, I know David Senra, who does the podcast, said that he met him in person, and everyone that works with him just loved him and said he was just a really kind person. Um, but yeah, I thought it was really interesting because he really got a lot of his wealth from buying up other companies and doing mergers and acquisitions and thinking about how you integrate cultures when you're buying up companies at that speed, I thought was very interesting because it seemed like he just kind of lets each company maintain their sense of identity, which I thought was really interesting because it seems like a lot of people try to assimilate one company into another completely and people struggle with that sometimes. Um, and he also just had really interesting ways of finding these really niche companies that he was buying because it was everything I think from like waste management to construction equipment rental and Logistics. he just has these yeah, yeah these teams of people that look all around the country for opportunities in like corners of of industries that people don't really operate in very often. So what were your big takeaways from it? 
Yeah, it was interesting. And listening to um, several different founders podcasts, um, it seems like <clears throat> there's like a couple common themes among like super successful people. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them is that they study successful people before them. <laughs> yeah. And so almost every single one of the people that we listen to have, have read endless biographies mm-hmm. of people from Napoleon to Rockefeller. And, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And the other thing that really jumps out at me and, and continues to jump out at me almost every single day in a book or podcast is um, your ability to recruit talent. Mm, yeah. And I think Brad talked a little bit about that in this podcast as well, where it's just like, it does not matter how great of an idea you mm-hmm. have, um, anything at scale requires like world-class talent yeah. to be able to grow it and develop it and to build something into much bigger than, than what your mm-hmm. vision is. Yeah, that reminds me of like A players, I think is how he framed it, right? And it's like you can never overestimate the value of having a team full of A players because what you need to build something impressive. Yeah, I think it was Steve Jobs that said at Pixar was the first time that he had been in a company that was just full of A players. And at that time, there was like 400 people. So that's like incredible to think about the talent at that company. But one of the things that they talk about is, you know, uh, Every every company and organization, of course, wants A players uh, in their organization, but they're mm-hmm. they're hard to find. First of all, yeah. um, because there's only so many A players out there. But also, if you begin to settle for B players mm-hmm. and you put B players in management positions or recruiting positions, then they begin to settle for C players, <laughs> right. and then all of a sudden you have a very average C level company. Yeah. Um, and so I thought that was a really important distinction. And and for people that are looking to grow organizations, whether it's business or nonprofits or, mm-hmm. or otherwise, um, thinking about uh, making sure that you're getting A players first mm-hmm. and and really sticking true to those values, I think will help you much more in the long long run because as we know turnover um, making bad hires can really set you back months if not years and Mm -hmm. cost you tens or hundreds or millions of dollars um, in the long run for sure yeah no that was a great point and sometimes it is tempting when you're desperate to fill a position just to settle for the first person that kind of fits the bill Um, but I think he was pretty adamant that you need to wait and hold out for the right person I think the other point from that podcast that really resonated with me was the importance of having control over your mindset and your emotions Mm -hmm. I think Brad Jacob said that he has been meditating since he was a teenager, which is just really interesting. But just any one of our friends who are in business know that there are a lot of highs and lows emotionally in business. There are a lot of times when, you know, you feel worried about what's happening in the market or you have turnover or whatever the case might be. And just the importance of cultivating mindfulness, cultivating an ability to control your emotional state. I mean, Tony Robbins talks about this, the nervous system stuff that I like to follow talks about this, but it's so true because you're so much more clear headed when you keep yourself in a positive mental state. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like, it's building a muscle, I think. And I remember like when we first got into real estate, for example, if we had, two or three pending transactions Mm -hmm. and something went awry in one of them, like my entire world fell apart. You know, we're thinking like, oh my gosh, how are we going to pay our bills and feed our kids? And, you know, you're just, your world comes crumbling down so quickly. Um, And then as you grow and you find some success and and you you learn to process those experiences in a different way, then the problems don't go away. They're just different problems Mm -hmm. Um, and they, they begin to scale. But I think... What changes is, as you understand now, you have tools um, in, in place to be able to handle those in a much better way. I think yeah. I saw a quote the other day that um, your ability to manage problems basically determines your success. Yeah. <laughs> um, because that's really all business and, and, and a large part of life really is, is it's problem after problem that, that you're trying to solve and, yeah. and, and fix. And whether that's bringing a new product to market because there's a problem that, that currently isn't being solved or it's within your own uh, life or business or, mm-hmm. or whatever it may be that's going on and how you can manage those things. Yeah, I think you just sent me a quote the other day that was something like, the road to success is paved with problems well handled yes. or mistakes well handled, mm-hmm. either one, substitute. Yeah. But yeah, it's true. I mean, the way you react, and that's what Charlie Munger always says too, is problems are just a sign of life. And if you don't expect to have problems, then mm-hmm. you're being pretty foolish. Yes, for sure. Cool. Well, we're going to jump into probably your favorite category ever, clothing? which is clothing. And I mean, so, cheese and clothing. Cheese and clothing. Pretty tight. Is, yeah, I know. <laughs> so I do not love shopping. Um, well, let me let me preface no, this. Okay. I don't love clothes shopping. Mm-hmm. I like. I, I would love it if someone just said, "These are the clothes that you should wear. This this makes you look as good as you can look. Mm-hmm. Um, put these on. They fit well, and and be done." Mm-hmm. Um, but. 
I go through the tedious process of with you of, of selecting clothes so that I look somewhat presentable when I show up to work <laughs> in other places every day. But I do love shopping for like electronics and tech and those types of things too. So mm-hmm. I won't say I don't. I, I hate shopping altogether. It's just there's certain things I like yeah, shopping for. Yes, but you're the you're the clothing expert, uh, or at least the Amazon opening box, <laughs> Amazon box <laughs> opening start expert. Start like a YouTube channel of opening my Amazon boxes. Yeah, so. Um, I mentioned the normal brand, which we discovered in Nashville. Um, what are your What are your thoughts on on that brand? Because I know you like to purchase from there as well. Um, yeah, so I like to purchase stuff for you on yeah, there. Yeah. yeah, to be clear. I mean, I haven't tried the women's stuff; it might be great. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, that was kind of funny because we were just shopping around in Nashville. Gosh, probably a couple of years ago now when we were there, and you just stumbled into a store and started trying stuff on, and every single thing fit really well. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems like a really nice quality of clothing. You can tell when. I mean, even when I buy stuff on Amazon, you know, sometimes you get things that you're you know it's not going to last mm-hmm. for more than a couple of weeks. Um, but like the the uh, material of every shirt just seems really like sturdy and like it's going to fit well. But I think for men especially, like height really affects and like the length of your arms, the length of your legs versus your waist affects how things fit. And I know yeah. for you, it can be really tricky to find things that are long enough, but also slim enough. Mm-hmm. And so it seems like their shirts in particular really fit you well. And so I just yeah. dove deep and bought like every color that I liked <laughs> yeah. of certain shirts for you for mm-hmm. Christmas and birthdays and all of that. Yeah. It's so hard for probably for, for most people just generally, I know women have a much more difficult time at this than men, but the sizes for men are basically like small, medium, and large for shirts, mm-hmm. you know, until you get into like custom and, and dress shirts and things too. But the problem is, is like I'm six foot one, two in that range, right. and I have like freakishly long arms. And <laughs> A so, swimmer's build. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm fairly thin. And so for me, like there is a very specific size shirt that, fix, mm-hmm. that fits me and almost no stores have that shirt. Mm-hmm. And if they do, they're often out of stock. And so like yeah. Express, for example, has like their extra slim medium mm-hmm. that works for me. And, and, and uh, Lucky has some that, that works and stuff too. But yeah, it's, 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 I'm getting anxious just thinking about clothing shopping <laughs> because it's just, it's, it's not fun. I think that you just tend to, true to your personality, be efficient and find what works. And so pants like Express mm-hmm. has the length and the, mm-hmm. um, what it would be like the waist and the length mm-hmm. that you need. And you just buy yeah. like every color every time they have a new style of them. Yes, exactly. Um, but, but it is funny that you say, cause for women, I think there's even a wider variety of, and it's the same thing. Even my dad used to say this, like men's pants, at least you get a waist and a length measurement for women's. It's really like two, four, six, eight, ten, mm-hmm. nothing. And they might have like a short and a tall version of it, but it's not so exact. So it is, it's a real struggle to find stuff that fits you. And yeah. so once you find, you just got to commit and find what works. Yeah, you do. And that's, that's what I do. Yeah. That's exactly <laughs> what you do. Um, I did want to jump over to, um, the more recent vibe and talk about tribe. I feel like tribe is a word that is maybe overused sometimes, Mm -hmm. um, but it does resonate, I think, when we think about tribe. Like, what what emotions come to mind for you, and what are your thoughts around just that as a concept? Um, It just makes me think of the people that we have a deep level of, like, love and trust with, so it makes me think of first of all, me, you, and the kids, and I think you were like trying to make me cry with this little picture oh, of yeah. those two mm-hmm. because that's definitely from a couple of years ago with Ford's big round head. <laughs> um, but for me, what it comes what comes to mind is just the people that like really care about you, the people that um, you know if they called at two a.m. and they were stuck in a ditch, you would hop out of your bed and to help them, and vice versa, kind mm-hmm. of a person. Um, and I think we are incredibly fortunate that we have family that that extends to. We have friends that that extends to. We have colleagues that that extends to. And we just, we really are very fortunate to be surrounded by people like that. And as you're going through life and you're trying to run a business and you're trying to raise kids and, you know, do all the things that you do, people say it takes a village, but it really does. I mean, if we didn't have your parents to pick the kids up from school on a dime or, you know, at work, I think I've like thrown my stapler on. Turner's desk running out the door and, you know, just like silly little things, but we all just jump in and help each other. Um, It just makes life easier. And I think as humans, we are built for relationships to be the thing that make us the happiest. I think every study of human longevity and happiness and health 
constantly points back to the importance of relationships. And I think you even hear it. This makes me think of um, Tony Robbins talking about that he went to the was like the goat dinner, Mm G-O-A-T, with like all of these highest performers in different areas of industry. And the only thing all of them wanted to talk about was the quality of their relationships. Mm -hmm. These are all men that were in their 50s, 60s, had accomplished great things. And what was top of mind for them was how their marriage was going, how their kids were doing. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, tribe, we are come from tribal beings as humans and as mammals, and we depend on one another for survival. And knowing that you have those people around you is something that you just, you can't under or overestimate how important it is. Yeah, I think it's important for for all um, parts and seasons of life too. You know, you want a tribe around you to celebrate all of the wins, you mm-hmm. know. Um, it's so cool when you're getting married and having kids and, and celebrating uh, amazing things in life to have people cheering you on and, and being there to share those experiences with you. Um, and, and then, you know, when things are challenging, you know, the same thing, you, you know, everybody goes through loss and challenges and mm-hmm. difficult situations. And you just want to know that as you go through those types of things, that there are people that you can always lean on and, mm-hmm. and fall back on. And I think right now, you know, in living in such a digital age, you know, and, you know, I'm like, I love tech and, and living in the digital world, but it can be isolating, you know, mm-hmm. as much as we are connected through technology and our phones and social media and different things. It's not the same as sitting in a room with mm-hmm. with your closest friends or family and 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 sharing a meal and having conversation mm-hmm. and reading each other's physical emotion and and just having that experience. And I think that <clears throat> I think that that's so important. Like you said, longevity studies you know point to that frequently in terms of um, our our health uh, later in life, especially. But. Mm-hmm. Um, it just brings fulfillment and happiness, I think, mm-hmm. in our lives. And finding that tribe, I think, is it's probably uh, one of the most important things that you can do. You know, f- we're, we're fortunate in that, you know, um, we have amazing supportive families mm-hmm. that we've we've grown up into. And um, we, we have friends that, that uh, we've known our entire lives and colleagues that are incredible. But not everyone ha- was born into those circumstances. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that it's important for everyone to continue to seek that out, even mm-hmm. if you don't currently have that tribe like don't stop looking you know maybe you need to shift some things around or join some different organizations or involve yourself in some different hobbies or something to find that because Mm -hmm. it it may not seem important when things are going okay or well um, Mm -hmm. but it becomes critically important when things are not yeah and and you're right it can feel difficult to do that as an adult especially when you're busy and you don't know and everybody's online instead of in person but I agree like joining organizations or going places aligned with your interests where people that are like you are likely to be it's a it's a worthwhile investment of time because it is really important Mm -hmm. absolutely Hmm. cute and speaking of tribe i hope that these two like you said avery and ford it's really cute to see how they look out for each other Mm -hmm. and you know avery likes to boss ford around but she also keeps an eye out for him and he looks up to her and relies on her too she is very much a little mom to him which is funny to watch and (laughs) and what's what's even crazier is he often listens to her which is (laughs) so funny because her little tiny body is bossing him around and he just follows her blindlessly half the time (laughs) and so um yeah no it's 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 really cool watching them grow up and 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 seeing them kind of develop their little tribes too Um, that's that's fun to watch and you know they have friends that um, that they've known. Uh, some of their friends visited them in the hospital as they were being right. born. You know, which is just incredible. And I hope they can maintain those friendships their whole their whole life, like I've been able to do with with many of mine. Absolutely, yeah. Well, we, oh wait, we do have to cover one more thing. What? So this is something that I've always laughed about with you. And then I, when I saw you were putting it in the vibe this week, I was thinking it was very funny is your fear of ants yes. and your assertion that they are the scariest creatures in the entire world if they were bigger. They still are the scariest creatures in the entire world. So ants outnumber us by a lot, just so you know. So like this Ant is facts. not a fair fight. They're a fair, fair fight. But yes. <laughs> If, if you have never seen a zoomed in picture of an ant, especially their face, it is the scariest demonic monster face that you will ever see in your entire life. Like, I don't know why they even have a category of horror movies that just isn't ant horror movies. Because well, I mean, like, they did make Bugs Life and Ants. Yeah, but like, it's, it's terrifying. And so like, when you zoom in on that, like horrific monster face there you can just see the damage that it can do and just imagine like and I know this is a ridiculous concept but we've all seen Honey I Shrunk the Kids and you know like 
technology is improving rapidly, and so maybe on some in some day this could be true. But imagine if we could blow up an ant to be the size of a human. Imagine these little guys can lift fifty times their body weight. Well, so can Ford. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's what he says anyway. <laughs> fifty times their body weight, and so they have these like massive like teeth or pinchers or whatever you want to call them. They can organize really rapidly together. They like look like little aliens. It's terrifying, and they could do some serious damage. I mean, you put a piece of cheese on an anthill in the summertime and see what happens. I mean, you can see, like, they do some damage really quickly. To cheese, and you do love cheese. I do love cheese, too, but they're terrifying. And I don't know why everybody else isn't as terrified as me of them. Like, I'll pick up a snake. Like, I, it does not... I'm scared of no animal. I mean, if I was... Spiders. Spiders. Face- Bugs, bugs in general. Okay. Bugs. Yes, I don't like bugs. And so Rachel is the bug killer in our house. But if there's a rodent or a snake or if I was face to face with a, uh, we've been face to face with in a bear situation, mm-hmm. which was pretty terrifying in and of itself. But ants, ants take the uh, take the mountain. All right, well, I'll take the ants out for you then. Yes, please I'm do. I'm also wondering if you were traumatized by Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. And that's where this whole it could be. thing came from. Maybe. Yeah, it could be. Well, on on that note, um, we have just wrapped up episode number four, number and four. so hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, we didn't spend as much time talking about technology this time, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that next time. And so, uh, let us know if you guys have feedback or have topics we want to talk about. But we look forward to chatting again soon. And don't forget to go to theviveweekly.com if you want to sign up for the email newsletter or just follow along in all the blogs. Yeah, thanks, guys. If you're interested in the topics that you're hearing about on The Vibe, please check out our website. It's theviveweekly.com. There you can subscribe to our weekly newsletter. You can check out all the blogs with all of the recommendations that Dustin makes, links to purchase things, full videos, links to articles. It's a great resource to go even a little bit deeper on some of the topics that we talk about on the podcast.